Greetings from First United Methodist Church of Los Alamos, New Mexico. We hope this message will be meaningful and relevant to your life and your relationship with God. We invite you to join us for worship on Sunday mornings. We have now resumed in-person worship with one service at 10 a.m., which is live streamed both on Facebook and on YouTube. We alternate each week between contemporary and traditional music. You may confirm worship times and receive more information by visiting our website, firstinyourheart.org. Now may you be blessed through the reading and hearing of God's holy word. Our first reading is from the Gospel of Mark. After Jesus has cleansed the temple, he and the disciples return to the temple, where Jesus is questioned by a series of different groups trying to trap him. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, he asked him, Which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, The first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and besides him there is no other. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself, this is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask him any question. Our second reading comes from the book of Ruth, which serves as a sort of minority report against Ezra and Nehemiah, who are seeking to purify Judaism and condemn interreligious and interracial marriages, as well as rules made against Moabites and their relationship to Israel. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to live in the country of Moab, he and his wife and two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malam and Kilian. They were Ephraelites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabab Moabite wives. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. When they had lived there for about ten years, both Malin and Kilian also died, so that the woman was left without her two sons or her husband. Then she started to return with her daughters-in-law from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had had consideration for his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant them, the Lord grant that you may find security, each of you, in the house of your husband. Then she kissed them, and they wept aloud. Then they wept aloud again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So, she said, see your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die. There will I be buried. May the Lord do thus, and so to me, and more as well, if even death parts me from you. So Naomi returned together with Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, who came back from her, with her from the country of Moab. They came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. 
This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. So again, our guest preacher this morning is Kristen Beaudre, who is the executive director of Justice for Our Neighbors in El Paso, uh, which is a national immigration ministry with the United Methodist Church, originally came out of the United Methodist Committee on Relief, UMCOR, and is now a separate um, 501c3, a nonprofit. Uh, and so let us welcome Kristen to give us our message this morning. So thank you, Kathy, for reading that scripture. And with all of the complicated names to pronounce, I really appreciate you doing that. <laughs> the story of Ruth begins in Bethlehem, and we read that there is a famine. And so Elimelech and his wife, Naomi, immigrate to Moab with their two sons. They don't know how long the famine is going to last in Bethlehem. So when they get to Moab, they begin to build a life for themselves. Their sons grow up and marry local Moabite women, Orpah and Ruth. Then Elimelech dies, and their sons die too. Unfortunately, neither of the Moabite women were able to have children, and so Naomi doesn't have any heirs. Suddenly, Naomi, Orpah, and Ruth are all widows. And as widows in the ancient world, they have no social or economic power and are vulnerable to poverty, abuse, and even early death. As they're trying to figure out what to do and how they will survive, Naomi learns that the famine in Bethlehem is over. So she decides to return home and take Orpah and Ruth with her. But then she changes her mind and decides they should stay behind after all. The scripture doesn't tell us why she changes her mind. We can speculate that maybe Naomi remembers how hard it is to be an immigrant and doesn't want to put Orpah and Ruth through that, especially since the Israelites despised Moabites. She convinces Orpah to stay, but Ruth is determined to go with Naomi. This puts Naomi in a precarious situation as she returns to Bethlehem. Not only is she herself a widow, but she is returning with a widowed daughter-in-law. The scripture tells us that they return at the beginning of the barley harvest. And Naomi probably knew that this was a good time to return because the law of the land required farm owners to provide for vulnerable people at harvest time, including widows and foreigners. I don't know about you, but until recently, I hadn't heard the story of Ruth framed as a story of migration. It wasn't until I read this book, The God Who Sees by Karen Gonzalez. She herself is an immigrant from Guatemala and writes about stories in the Bible that are about immigrants and how those stories can teach us about how we should treat immigrants today. She wrote a chapter on the book of Ruth where I drew my inspiration for this message and her writing helped me see the story completely differently. So if we keep going in the story, once Naomi and Ruth make it to Bethlehem, they need food and a way to survive. We read that Ruth is welcomed into Boaz's field to glean what the regular harvesters left behind and bring it home to Naomi. Boaz gives Ruth a job and commands his workers to treat her with respect. Now, while Boaz usually gets framed as the hero of this story for his generosity, he was simply following the law of the land and God's commands for how to treat widows and immigrants. While Boaz does provide Ruth with a decent job and a decent living, he's not the hero of the story. Ruth works hard to take care of herself and Naomi. There are some comparisons worth noting in this story. Today, many immigrants do hard labor that most US citizens are unwilling to do, including a lot of agricultural work. However, the, Ruth, the work that Ruth does is the kind of work that most people did in ancient Judah. Additionally, Boaz commands his workers to treat Ruth with respect. Unfortunately, today, many immigrant women are not afforded respect or protection from workplace harassment or sexual assault. Boaz also invites Ruth to join him and his workers in breaking bread together. She is allowed the same rights as a native Judean, including a Sabbath day to rest. Today, many migrant workers are not afforded days off and are exploited for their labor. The story of Ruth can show us how, by following God's commands, citizens and immigrants can work together for the common good. And the result is that everyone flourishes and thrives. Everyone has something to offer in this story. Ruth is a poor immigrant widow who is also a hard worker. She's loyal to Naomi and takes good care of her. 
Naomi is a citizen and a cultural insider and knows how to navigate the laws of the land. She helps Ruth benefit from the laws that provide for, for the poor and the immigrant. Boaz has the most power in this story and he uses it for the common good, choosing justice and compassion over the exploitation of his workers. He offers Ruth a way to earn an honest living and provides a safe work environment for her before there is any benefit to him, long before there is any promise of marriage between them. Ultimately, the book of Ruth is the story of an immigrant woman who arrives in Judah and is welcomed and accepted as one of Judah's own. She leaves her own country, language, and culture out of love for her mother-in-law. She, she is an outsider who teaches the people of Judah what true love and loyalty can look like. Now, I invite you to imagine with me if Ruth were to come to the U.S. today, what would happen to her? How would she be treated? There are a couple of possible scenarios we can explore. The first one is, depending on what country she came from, she could be expelled under a policy called Title 42. Title 42 is a policy that was implemented in 2020 that expels immigrants and asylum seekers either back to Mexico or back to their country of origin due to public health concerns because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Over 1.8 million people have been expelled under Title 42. For the second scenario, let's imagine that there's more to the story that we don't know about and that Ruth is fleeing violence. Let's imagine she's coming to the US to seek asylum, which is legal and a human right. If she came to the US to seek asylum, she could be enrolled in the Remain in Mexico program. Remain in Mexico, or MPP, is a policy that forces asylum seekers to stay in Mexican border towns for the duration of their court proceedings. This policy has impacted over 70,000 asylum seekers. Now these two scenarios, Title 42 and MPP, both present human rights concerns. Mexican border towns are not safe for asylum seekers, and there have been many reports of violence, sexual assault, kidnapping, extortion, and murder of asylum seekers expelled under Title 42 or enrolled in MPP. They are inhumane policies that endanger those who come to our border seeking safety. And if Ruth were subject to one of these policies, she would surely be in danger in Mexico. A third scenario is that Ruth could be detained at one of the detention centers we serve at JFON El Paso. We represent migrants detained at the four detention centers that operate out of the El Paso Immigration Court. There's one in El Paso and the other three are in New Mexico, one in Otero County in Southern New Mexico, one in Torrance County and one in Cibola County. And I wanna tell you a little bit about immigration detention. Immigration and Customs Enforcement operates over 200 long-term detention centers throughout the United States where the agency incarcerates people who are awaiting immigration proceedings, which could include a final determination of their proceedings if they're being granted some sort of relief or potential deportation. People in ICE detention can include individuals who were initially apprehended by Customs and Border Protection at the border or Border Patrol who have been transferred to ICE custody or individuals apprehended directly by ICE in other parts of the US. Immigrants in detention can be undocumented or documented immigrants, including people whose immigration status is not current, is expired, or is under review. People in detention include survivors of torture, people seeking asylum, visa holders, people who have been granted the permanent right to live in the US, people who have lived here for years and may have US citizen spouses and children, individuals with mental health and medical conditions, and other vulnerable groups. An estimated 70% of immigrants detained in these prison-like facilities have no criminal record, and much of the 30% that do only have minor violations, such as traffic violations. It is in our United Methodist Social Principles that we oppose immigration policies that separate family members from each other. All of the policies that I've discussed, including Title 42 and MPP, separate families. However, I would argue that immigration detention is the policy and practice that does this the most. In any of these scenarios, Ruth would be separated from Naomi. It is also important to note that immigration violations fall under civil proceedings and not criminal proceedings, 
Because of this, there is no right to government-appointed legal counsel in immigration court. Additionally, many detention centers are in remote rural locations, making access to legal counsel even more challenging. Immigration detention centers are known for human rights violations. People in detention, including our clients, regularly report issues with lack of access to adequate food and water, sanitation and hygiene issues, including lack of access to soap and hand sanitizer, lack of access to medical care, the abuse of solitary confinement, prolonged periods of detention, physical, psychological, and sexual abuse, and a lack of access to legal counsel. Tragically, since 2003, over 200 people have died in ICE custody. If Ruth were to come to the US today and be detained by ICE, she would be vulnerable to all of the dangers that I just mentioned. Hopefully, we would be able to represent her to secure her release so that she could go and stay with Naomi for the duration of her court proceedings. But she also might not be released and would face potentially being deported from the detention center. A fourth and least likely scenario of what might happen to Ruth if she were to come to the US today is that she would be processed by Border Patrol, put into deportation proceedings, given a court date, and released to go and stay with Naomi. She would likely be put into one of ICE's alternative to detention programs, which include electronic surveillance through ankle monitors or smartphone monitoring to ensure she showed up for her court date. When I read the book of Ruth and think about what might happen to her if she came to the US today, I can't help but wonder, what kind of blessings would Judah have missed out on had Ruth not been allowed to migrate with Naomi? The story is an important part of our faith heritage Obed, the son of Ruth and Boaz, eventually becomes the grandfather of King David. How different would the biblical narrative have played out had Ruth not been treated like a citizen and allowed to work to take care of herself and Naomi? The book of Ruth gives us a picture of the immigrant and the citizen working together side by side for the good of their community. It is a story of a community that cares for immigrants and others in vulnerable situations. And the result is that everyone flourishes and thrives. At JFON El Paso, we envision a world where our immigrant neighbors have the rights and access to be fully participating members of our communities for the good of everyone. One way that we try to help make this happen is by securing the release of immigrants from immigration detention. While all of our clients still have pending deportation cases when they are released, they are able to go and stay with family or friends and be part of a community while they await their proceedings. Hopefully they will eventually be granted some sort of immigration relief or benefit and have legal permission to work. Hopefully they will meet someone like Boaz in their community who will offer them work and protection. We offer these services completely free of charge. Because of this, we need financial support to be able to continue to do this work. I invite you to consider supporting us. Your donations go directly to securing the release of our clients from detention. We know that offering legal services and getting people released from detention is just one strategy for helping to realize our vision. Another important piece of our mission is advocacy. We advocate for policies that support immigrants, giving them opportunities like the opportunities afforded to Ruth. We work with other partner organizations and with the United Methodist Church to advocate for an end to inhumane policies like Title 42, Remain in Mexico, and the practice of immigration detention. It is not enough to end these policies. We must also restore our asylum system to be able to welcome people seeking safety with dignity. Finally, the third part of our mission is education. We believe it is important to educate the broader community on issues that impact immigrants, so we often give educational presentations on topics related to what I have shared with you today. And I want to invite you in joining us to create the kind of world we want to live in, the kind of world where our immigrant neighbors have the rights and access to be fully participating members of our community for the good of everyone. The kind of world where, if Ruth were to arrive at our borders today, she would be afforded the same opportunities as she was in ancient Judah. May it be so. Amen. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to follow our YouTube channel and Twitter, and like us on Facebook if you haven't already. And remember that every action you take today could change someone's life. 
So make sure it's a good one and be an agent of love. God bless.